children, it's ready to leave children's church. And now it's time for Dave to take over. Yay. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice to have a lovely time in Children's Church. Okay, thank you to Jason and Nicola for seeing us so far through our service. Uh, isn't it great to see different people? <laughs> Round of applause indeed. Isn't it great to see different people? Uh, up front and leading and getting involved so thank you to you next week will be different people again uh, up front so uh, variety is a spice of life and we will specialise in it David, I've just seen you lovely to see you special welcome to you David we've not seen you in a long time great to have you with us okay, who has a bible uh, with them? a few hands, okay if you don't have a bible can I ask you once again to uh, Facilitate one, either on your phone or there's some at the back that if you need one, put a hand up and stewards can get one to you. Um, it'll be great to have Bibles uh, together this morning. Brilliant. Thank you to the stewards for leaping into action. Utter professionals. Fantastic. Put your hand up if you have ever heard it said, either to you or, or to other people, um, who's ever heard it said to me, you Christians, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. Who said that? You Christians, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. Yesterday at our Sharing Jesus uh, training, somebody, I can't remember who it was, was mentioning a previous minister here. Um, who, who uh, when someone came into the church and said, oh, Christians are just all hypocrites, uh, he said, well, join us, because one more won't make a lot of difference. Um, brilliant answer to give. Here's the deal. This side of glory, all of us are hypocrites. All of us. There are things that uh, we can't change about that. But there are also things which, as a, as a body of believers, sometimes as Christians, we need to face up and say, actually, we were hypocrites. Here, we messed up. This morning, we were due to be back in Philippians, carrying on our uh, series uh, through the book of Philippians. But uh, uh, I've been busy preparing Philippians. And then uh, by about Friday and into yesterday, I started to get that voice in, in my head. Um, not the one that needs some medication. Um, the one that usually you should listen to, uh, to say, actually, put that off for another week. Um, and I've been really challenged this week by the story of Lot. In a couple of different circumstances over the, over the past couple of weeks, uh, Sodom has come up in conversation for a whole host of different reasons and in a whole host of different contexts. Uh, and so I think following on from that, as I've reflected on the story and read the story, I've been really challenged by the story of Lot. Uh, and so I want this morning for us to pause and think about what I'm calling today the lot factor. The lot factor. Who watched the X Factor last night? A few people? Okay, did you, did you agree with the six chair choices? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, it's all a fix anyway. Uh, last night was the X Factor. Today we are talking about the lot factor. Now, what can you tell me about lot? Tell me about lot, anyone? Oh, he was, he was Abraham's nephew, yes. Anything else? He, okay, yeah, so connected with Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so, yeah, Abraham's nephew. So, um, Abraham's youngest brother, uh, there were three children. Abraham was the oldest and there were two uh, youngest, two younger ones. Uh, the youngest brother was Lot's dad. Lot had two daughters. We read about them in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. He, uh, Lot was married, he had a wife, and what happened to his wife? She turned into a pillar of salt, okay. Um, not a particularly happy ending to a marriage. Uh, fantastic. So, Lot gets where he is. His, his dad died. 
And so Lot goes to live with his granddad and with Uncle Abraham and Auntie Sarah. And then granddad dies. And so Lot goes travelling with Abraham and Sarah. That's Lot's story. That's how he comes to be in the story that we will uh, flick through in just a moment. Um, Now, the New Testament to Peter describes Lot as a righteous man. A righteous man. And we can't ignore that. I therefore can't slate Lot because according to scripture he was a righteous man. But it has to be said Lot made some ridiculous choices. And it's some of those that I want us to look at this morning. Because Aaron Khalifa read to us from uh, Genesis chapter 13. It's where we start to see uh, Lot's story. Uh, Keep your Bible open. We're going to skim through uh, Lot's story, which really begins in in chapter 13. The bit that, uh, because Aaron Khalifa read for us, where uh, Lot uh, Lot and his family had been travelling with Abraham and Sarah and all their clan. They'd been travelling around and so far everything had been good. But as their, excuse me, as their clans had grown and the space in which they were uh, staying was limited, they outgrew the space that they had. And they couldn't afford to stay together. Arguments broke out because everybody wanted... The, the, the small bit of land that was there, they wanted to graze their sheep. And so arguments broke out. That's the reason Abraham said, okay, you know what? I love you, but let's go separate ways. And he said to like, okay, you choose where you go. Look at everything that's before you. You choose where you go, and where you go, I'll go the opposite way. Um, the ball was in Lot's court. You choose the direction that you take. And we know the story, we just heard it. Lot chose the plain across to Sodom. And he chose it because, frankly, it was a bit of a self-serving choice. (coughs) He chose the part that he chose because it looked good. It looked attractive. It made business sense. There was perhaps more to gain because this was lush. It was green. There were pastures there. Uh, there, there 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 was stuff to be gained from this place. It made good business sense. It was a personal, uh, fairly self-centred choice that Lot made to go in that direction. Uh, He knew the reputation that Sodom had, but it didn't matter, because as he looked in that direction, it looked good. Perhaps the likes of the city attracted him, and so he chose that way. Isn't that exactly how we get led into sin. Because we have a choice of which direction we take in our lives and so often we choose what looks good to us at the time. We don't stop to think about the consequences. We we choose what, what looks attractive to us and what we can perhaps gain most from. Are you with me? That is exactly how we, as people are, are led into sin. Contrast that with Abraham. So if you're in Genesis 13, uh, from verse 14, after this has happened, after Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abraham, uh, look as far as you can see in every direction, north, south, east and west, I am giving you all this land as far as you can see uh, to you and your descendants as a permanent possession and I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you. Uh, So Abraham moved his camp to Hebron and settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre, and he built another altar there to the Lord. See the difference? Lot is like, okay, what looks best? What can I gain most from? What is more interesting? What is attractive? What's going to suit me? And he chose that way. And then when Abraham went that way, God said, actually, I'm going to bless you. And Abraham went and he built an altar to dedicate uh, to the Lord. In the meantime, because Lot had gone his way on, self-serf- on self-seeking uh, grounds, he missed out on that blessing which was promised to Abraham. And that's what sin does. It disqualifies us from God's blessing. It separates us from God. Lot moved to the plain, it 
says, near to Sodom and, and his choices. The choices that Lot made, perhaps for a get-rich-quick solution, the choices that Lot made to move in that direction put him then in dangerous proximity to everything that Sodom was synonymous with. We talk about Sodom. Tell me about Sodom. What was Sodom known for? Sexual Evil. Sexual immorality. Okay. Um, anything specific within sexual immorality? Does anyone want to name it? Someone name it. Thank you. I know that's what you're all thinking. No one was brave enough to say it. Uh, in our minds, Sodom equals sexual immorality, but predominantly within that, homosexuality. That's in our minds. Okay? And so in our minds, what happened to Sodom happened when we read on in, in, in the story in Genesis and you get to the bit where uh, all the men gather outside Lot's house and they're, they're calling for, the, uh, for, for him to let the, the, those two angels that they thought, thought were just visiting men to come out so they can have sex with them. And we say, right, that is therefore God destroyed Sodom because of their homosexuality, because of the sexual immorality. talk about sexual immorality. What I'm about to say in a moment might take you a little bit by surprise, so let me preface it by saying absolutely what I believe from reading scripture is that God made male and female. And that God institu instituted marriage to be between one male and one female. Sex within that context of a marriage between one man and one woman is completely, biblically sanctioned and good. Anything outside of that is what the Bible calls immorality. Now that might be sexual activity between two people of the same sex. It might equally be of two different, or people of two different sexes who, who are not married. Anything that happens outside of the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman, the Bible says, is sexual immorality. However, I would put to you this morning that that is not why Sodom was destroyed. Sexual immorality, homosexuality, whatever you want to describe it, in as much as that becomes the big issue for Christians, was not the biggest issue facing Sodom. It is not why Sodom was destroyed. Uh, keep a finger in Genesis, but turn with me to Ezekiel, chapter 16. Ezekiel comes just after Isaiah and Jeremiah. You then get into Lamentations and then Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel, chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16, and let me read to you from verse 49. Okay, if you've got a Bible, turn with me so you're not taking my word for it. I want you to see it in black and white. This is important. Ezekiel 16, from verse 49. Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony. And laziness, while the poor and the needy suffered outside her door. She was proud and committed detestable sins, and so I wiped her out, as you have seen. Are you with me? The church today likes to talk about Sodom to, to put down homosexuality. And yes, that was wrong, and it's sexual immorality, and it is a sin, but sin is sin. There is not one sin that is more important than the others. What actually Sodom got destroyed for was pride and greed and, and whatever else. And if we're honest, how much of that do we see in our lives and in the church today? And yet it goes unchallenged. If we're going to talk about sin, let's talk about sin. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, Sodom is used again and again and again, 27 times after this uh, 
initial story in Genesis. Sodom is used again 27 times, both by God speaking through uh, prophets in the Old Testament and through Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament. 27 times Sodom is used as an example, as a comparison, and as a warning. But every time it is used to speak to the people of God. (coughs) To challenge and to warn the people of God. Sometimes to say, you know what, Uh, you guys, you people of God, are worse than Sodom was. Sometimes it is used to say, okay, uh, when judgment comes, when Christ returns and judgment day comes, it will be just like it was in Sodom. It will be sudden. You won't see it coming. Elsewhere, it is used to warn the people of God, don't be like the people of Sodom. 27 times, Sodom is used as an example, as a comparison, as a warning, always, not to outsiders, but to the people of God. Can I suggest that there is perhaps a need to acknowledge and deal with sin within the body of Christ? We spend a lot of time looking at people outside and pointing out people's shortcomings and failures, but at the same time within the church, how many of us, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, at some point or right now are battling pride, greed, Gossip, lust, not tithing. According to the Bible, it's a sin. Sin is sin. Let's address some of those things. I wonder this morning, what is your Sodom? If we've seen that Sodom represents not just one particular category of sin, but a, a whole wide range of sins, the, the big, the small, the, the obvious, the hidden, the, the ones we like to talk about and the ones we like to think nobody knows about. If Sodom represents all of those sins, what is your Sodom? Don't call out an answer. Because the deal is, this side of heaven, every one of us has something. is yours. What I want to reflect on is is Lot's relationship with Sodom. Lot made his choice. He he, he chose the direction of his life to go and settle near to Sodom. It put him in, in close proximity to everything that Sodom represents. And so if you if you open your Bibles back in back in Genesis and we get to chapter 14. And chapter 14 tells us that uh, around this time, after uh, Lot has has settled near uh, to Sodom, around this time, war broke out. And so the first part of chapter 14 tells us a little bit about this battle that goes on, where one group of kings goes to battle against another group of kings, and they, they fight, basically, over Sodom. Battles like that are familiar through the pages of the Old Testament. Why? Because... We always want what we don't have. We always want what we don't have, and so we, we go and we do whatever it takes to get it. And so because these kings wanted something they didn't have, they went to battle for it. A battle happens. Now, Lot tells us got caught up in Sodom. Compare this. There's a journey that is made. Chapter 13, verse 12. Lot... Um, when, a- when Abraham leaves him, Lot settles, it says, uh, in the land of Canaan, he moved his tents to a place near, near Sodom. And so initially, Lot, he, he, he pitches his tent outside of Sodom, but somewhere near. By the time this battle comes and soldiers uh, invade and, and, they, and they take away those who are in Sodom, Lot gets carried away with them because by this point, he's moved further in. He's moved from having a tent pitched on the outside of Sodom, now he's got his house in Sodom. And so because he's moved into everything that represents sin and and everything else, he's moved into that neighbourhood, and because of that, he faces the consequences. He gets caught up. He gets carried away. He loses everything that he has. That's what sin does to us, isn't it? Verse 14, in chapter 14, tells us 
When Abraham heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilised the 318 trained men who had been born into his household. Uh, he pursued the army until he caught up with them. Uh, he divided his men, he attacked them. Uh, basically, he, 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 he rescued Lot. He brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions. <coughs> Lot had to be rescued from the captivity that was caused by sin. Lot had to be restored and set free. And isn't that exactly what Jesus did? When we were held captive by the choices, the consequences of the choices that we make, Jesus came to set us free, to restore us, to rescue us. I thought you'd be a little bit more excited. I'm excited by that. When we were held captive by the consequences of the choices that we made to do life our own way, when there was nothing we could do to get ourselves out of that captivity, Jesus came to set us free. Amen? I wonder if there are people here this morning who need to know that freedom. But you know, the next follow-up, after salvation comes, and here's a long word, something we call sanctification. It means after we've been set free from the consequences of the choices that we make, we've been set free by Jesus, uh, we, we're given a new life to live for him, and there begins a process uh, of, of what's called sanctification, which is basically a journey of, over time, as we're a follower of Jesus, becoming more and more like him. Whole hosts of passages of scripture talk about this journey. I'd love to remind you of just a couple. Don't worry about turning to these, I'll read them to you. John 17, when Jesus, just before his crucifixion, is uh, praying for his disciples, his prayer for them includes these words They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy. The NIV says, Sanctify them. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them. Your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them, so they can be made holy by your truth. You see, after we've been set free by Jesus, the the aim is that we are over time made holy. We become less and less like our old selves, and more and more like Christ. That's why Paul writes to the Romans, do not be... Here we go, Romans 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Here begins this journey of becoming a new person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's a bit of a bad translation. What it actually translates as is, the new is coming. There's a journey of becoming a new person. Galatians 5. All right, so the Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. He says, therefore, stand firm and don't be uh, burdened by a yoke of slavery. Don't still be held down by the things that held you down before. You have been set free, and so live that way. And Colossians 3. I'm not going to read it. You can read Colossians 3 in your own time. But it's the whole list of all the things that we should put off from our old selves, and all the things that we should put on in our new life. Read it when you get home, in the interest of time. Time and time again, Scripture speaks about this journey of, of we call it sanctification, of being made more and more over time, uh, less like our old selves, more like Jesus, and that journey is so important. Friends, can I ask you, how are you doing on that journey? How are you doing on that journey? Once you have given your life to Christ, it doesn't end there. It starts there. How is your journey away from your old self into being more and more like Christ? How is that going? Lot, having been rescued from the consequences of the choices that he made, found himself drawn further and further 
back into compromise. Back in Genesis, look with me at chapter 19. Verse 1, that evening, the two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting there. What was Lot doing there? He was in Sodom once before, by his choice. The consequences of that is he got captured and carried away when when, when, when Sodom got uh, attacked. He had to be rescued from the position that he was in, and yet now, a a few pages later, he is back in Sodom. What's he doing there? And this time, it's even worse than before, because that evening, the two angels came to the entrance of, of the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting there. Now, the fact that Lot was sitting there at the gates of the city, that is where the town council met. That is where those who were established within Sodom, the movers and the shakers, that is where they would sit of an evening. And, so, uh, and Lot had got himself in that crowd. And so, followed the journey. He started off, he pitched his tent uh, outside of Sodom. By chapter 14, he's living on, 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 uh, in, in a house in Sodom and he's raising his family there. By chapter 19, he's in with the movers and the shakers and he's sitting at the city gates, even though he's had to be rescued once and set free. He's back where he was. And he knows how bad his situation is, because look at verse 2. When these angels arrived... Lot thinks they're just normal men. Uh, Verse 2, my lords, he said, come to my home, wash your feet and be my guests for the night. Then you can get up early in the morning and go again. Lot doesn't want these people to see the reality of Sodom. Lot knows exactly what is going on in this place and he doesn't want his guests to see the reality of what is actually happening where he is. Do you recognise that? Are there times that we don't want people to see the real us? Are there parts of your life that you are horrified at the thought of people finding out about? Come and see this bit, but then go again so you don't see anything else. Verse 3. But Lot insisted, so at last they went home with him. Lot prepared a feast for them, complete with fresh bread, made without yeast, and they ate. You see, Lot was good, just like so many of us, at going through the motions at doing the right things to make it look as if everything is good. When actually we know different to the way we were when we had to be rescued the first time. Paul writes to the Galatians, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. He says, what you sow, you will reap. Let me get into verse 14. Genesis 19, verse 14. Uh, Lot rushed out to tell his uh, daughter's fiancé. So so, so after, uh, we've skipped out the graphic bit. So uh, after these guys go to Lot's house, you know the story. All the men of Sodom uh, come out. If you don't know the story, let's read it. Uh, So, verse 3, they they, they went to his house and they ate. Verse 4, before they retired for the night, all the men of Sodom, young and old, came from all over the city and they surrounded the house. They shouted to Lot, where are the men? who came to spend the night with you, bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Now, like I said earlier, we like to focus on that bit, but look at what's coming. So Lot stepped outside to talk to them, shutting the door behind him. Please, my brothers, he begged, don't do such a wicked thing. Look, I have two virgin daughters, let me bring them out to you. And you can do with them as you wish. We overlook that bit when we talk about Sodom, don't we? Uh, You can do with them as you wish. But please, leave these men alone, for they are my guests and are under my protection. Uh, Stand back, they shouted. And and this battle carries on. And then, verse 10, but the two angels reached out, pulled Lot into the house, and bolted the door. Then they blinded all the men, young and old, who were at the door of the house. So they gave up trying to get inside. The angels questioned Lot, do you have anyone else? Any other relatives here in the city? Get them out of this place. Your son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, anyone else. For we are about to destroy this city completely. The outcry against, the, against this place is so great that it has reached the Lord. And he, and he has sent us 
to destroy it. Verse 14, here we go. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's uh, fiancés, quick, get out of the city. The Lord is about to destroy it. But the young men thought he was only joking. I wonder how many people today, when we talk about sin and its consequences, when we talk about the coming judgment of Jesus Christ, how many people think it's a joke or it's irrelevant or it's not happening or it doesn't matter because they can't see it right now. Friends, judgment is real. There will come a time, we don't know when, ignore the people they tell you they know when it's happening, but there will come a time. And the other week we read out the checklist that Jesus said, this will happen before I come, and, and we ticked off pretty much all of them. Well, I leave that with you. A time is coming when Jesus will come again and hold every single one of us to account. Friends, judgment is real. Let's not ignore it. One of the times Sodom is mentioned is by Jesus. Luke 17, don't worry about turning again, I'll, I'll read it to you. Luke 17, from verse 28. Uh, the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building, until the morning Lot left Sodom. And then fire and burning sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them. Yes, it will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You see, don't assume that we will know when that time is near and have time to put things right in our lives. We won't. Judgment is real. Back in Genesis 14. From verse 15. He divided up, no. Gen sorry, Genesis 19, forgive me. Genesis 19, from verse 15. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry up, they said to Lot. Take your wife, your two daughters who are here. Get out right now or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. You see, if you spend too long caught up in the things that you know are wrong, it will be too late. Get out right now or you will be swept away. Uh, when Lot still hesitated, the angels seized his hand and the hands of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city. Uh, for the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives. Don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. You see, Lot, even after he's been rescued once, even after he's been reminded that actually if you don't get out of this place now, you're not going to be lucky the second time. Even after that, he had to literally be grabbed and dragged out of that place. And on top of that, Whilst he's being dragged out of that place and is told, get far away from here, go to the mountains, he is still clinging on to home comforts. He said, oh, please don't make me go to the mountains. I won't be able to survive there. Please can I go to this little town instead? For goodness sake. What does it take for us to get far away from our old way of life? To stop flirting with the sin that we've already been set free from. Why do we keep stopping and looking back and playing with the idea that actually this is quite nice. I'd rather be there. Lot was saved purely by the grace of God. Why? Because even when we are unfaithful, God is Praise God for that. I wonder where you sit as we've reflected on Lot's journey, his relationship with Sodom from pitching a tent outside the city to moving into the city to then being a part of daily life with the movers and the shakers and raising his family there after he had already been set free and was meant to be far away. I wonder if you identify yourself in any part of that story. If you do, I speak this morning with no judgment whatsoever, but simply a loving plea, just like the angel said to Lot, get out of there. Get out of there. 
You've already been rescued once, you've been set free from the consequences of the life choices that you make, but there will come a time when we will have no warning and judgment will come again, and that time, <coughs> eternity is in the balance. If you find yourself flirting with your old way of life, instead of putting it behind you and becoming more and more like Jesus, get out of there. Let me read to you. Romans chapter 6, just before we finish. And as I read, I'd love you to reflect on these words. And if I can, I'd like to give you homework this week. Will you read Romans chapter 6 once every day? Let me take time in the evening, in quietness. Sit and read through Romans chapter 6. Reflect on what it says, but read it through every single day this week. And see how God speaks. Romans chapter 6, Paul writes, well then. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ... We were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. And so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom from God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realise that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? So you can be a slave uh, to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Later on, verse 23, right at the end of that chapter. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Friends, that choice is before us. It is your choice. Lot's choices led him into sin. His life got messy and he needed rescuing. What is Sodom for you? What is it that makes your life messy? Have you been set free by Jesus? He's already died for you. He's already been raised from the dead to defeat death for you. Have you claimed that for yourself? If you haven't, you can today. And whatever went before is behind you. 
We heard that salvation leads on to sanctification. Friends, are you living in freedom? Having been set free by Jesus Christ, are you growing in Christ? Or are you still flirting with that old way of life and, and still spending time there instead of moving forward? If you need to, can I plead with you today, get out of that place. Lot escaped God's judgment just because of the grace of God. Friends, if Jesus was to return today, if you this afternoon were called to give an account to God for your life, for the choices that you made, if that were to happen today with no warning, how would you fare? If your answer is, I don't know. If your answer is, you know what, I'm worried that I might not fare very well. Do not leave this place today without fixing that. Jesus came and died for you, to set you free, so that your past can be behind you and a new life can be ahead of you. Make the most of that. Don't waste it. That applies to you. See me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. And so you can know for certain if Jesus were to return this afternoon and hold you to account, there would be nothing to fear.